Welcome, Ben Mama. It could be argued that the Fairchild Channel F is the most important console ever. That's because the Channel F, the F stood for fun, yes really, was the very first programmable games console, more on that in due course, and without it we never would have had the Atari 2600 and the huge industry that followed. That last part is perhaps a bit of hyperbole, but its significance certainly can't be dismissed, and more people need to know about its importance in video game history, which is why all of you voted it to be the subject of my latest Amazing Facts video, where it led the poll from the very start, despite many people, myself included, expecting the Master System to win. As the first proper games console, the Fairchild Channel F was also moderately successful, selling over 350,000 units at a time when the technology was not only very new, but also very expensive. The console would have cost close to $800 in today's money. This meant it was more successful than the very first console, the Magnavox Odyssey, and proved there was an appetite for video games in the home. Remember this was a time when most people went to arcades to get their electronic kicks. It was on the market for 7 years, released across most of the world, and made a number of innovations in its design and implementation that live on to this day. In this video I'll be going through all these amazing facts that truly shine a light on this console's incredible legacy and hopefully educate many of you in the process. But with this intro out of the way, it's time to go on the trivia trail once again as I reveal 10 amazing Fairchild Channel F facts. Channel F, the one with all the fun. The Fairchild Video Entertainment System at your larger JCPenney. The home entertainment system that never gets old. Plug in a new video card and change the fun. Play tic-tac-toe, shooting gallery, or just doodle. Switch video cards and play Desert Fox. Switch again, it's Blackjack. Or play the two built-in games, Pro Hockey or Tennis Champ. Channel F for fun. The Fairchild Video Entertainment System. Just $169.95. Video card cartridges, $19.95 each. At your larger JCPenney. I think it's only right that I start with the most well-known fact about the Channel F, and the one that very much secures its place in the history books. It was the very first fully programmable games console. The first actual games console, the Magnavox Odyssey, didn't have a CPU, so it couldn't be programmed. All the cartridges did was change jumpers within the system to display different blocks on the screen. Incredibly limited indeed. The Channel F changed that, but it's not to say that other people didn't have the same idea, because it narrowly beat the RCA Studio 2 to market, which was plagued with problems during its development, and Fairchild were fortunate the development of what became the Atari Video Computer System was also delayed by a no-compete clause, after a lawsuit from Magnavox resulted from Atari stealing the idea for Pong from them. However, despite being released in 1976, development of the Channel F actually started a lot earlier, way back in 1974 in fact, at a company called Alpex Computer Corporation. Two of their employees, Wallace Kirshner and Lawrence Haskell, have been developing a prototype for home video game system centred around an Intel 8080 microprocessor and interchangeable circuit boards containing programmable ROM chips. The duo shopped the system around to numerous television manufacturers, but none of them showed any interest sadly. Then they contacted a buyer at Fairchild, who sent Chief Engineer Jerry Lawson to evaluate the system, more on him later. Lawson was suitably impressed by the console and suggested Fairchild license the technology, which the company did, and developed it further into the Channel F. Lawson worked with industrial designer Nick Tailsfor and mechanical engineer Ron Smith to turn the prototype into a viable project. Changes included replacing the 8080 with Fairchild's own F8 CPU, adapting the prototype's complex keyboard controls into a single control stick and encasing the ROM-based circuit boards into plastic cartridges. Tails4 was also responsible for the design of the controllers, cartridges and the console itself while Smith was responsible for the mechanical engineering of the video game cartridges and controllers. I 
I've just mentioned how the Channel F was the first console to use interchangeable ROM cartridges, and the first to have a programmable CPU to take advantage of them, but it's also worth touching on how those cartridges came about, because that's a pretty interesting story in itself. The idea of using boards containing ROM chips was already finalised before Fairchild took on the project, but the actual implementation of them wasn't. Designer Nick Tails 4 got the idea for their design whilst using the stereo in his car. The 8-track tapes that it utilised seemed to be the perfect fit. They were just the right size and shape and the design was already appealing to consumers, so he simply copied the casing, just changing the hole at the bottom to expose the edge connector of the board inside. This would then be the design that most of their later rivals, including Atari, would copy. This was the reason why many people referred to cartridges as tapes in the early years of the video game industry, particularly in Japan. One of the most standout features of the Fairchild console is its unusual looking controllers. As I already mentioned, albeit briefly, the original prototypes of what would become the Channel F featured keyboard-like controls, much like the console's first big rival, the RCA Studio 2 in fact. These controllers were hardwired into the console itself and were notable for not having a base, being designed purely as handheld devices. The main body consists of a large hand grip with a triangular top. This part could actually be moved for full 8-way directional control. Not just that however, it could also be used as a paddle by simply twisting it. Very innovative indeed. That's not all though, there's even more uses for this part, as it could also be pushed down like a fire button or pulled up like a pinball plunger. Because the controllers didn't stand up on their own, the console had a small compartment for storing them. Later versions of the console changed them from being hardwired to being plug-in, which made them a lot easier to change if they went wrong, and a new version of the controller was also introduced too, but more on those revisions later. Interestingly, a 1978 sales catalogue also listed keyboard video cards for sale, as well as a keyboard controller add-on, a real throwback to the original 1974 design. The three shown were K1 Casino Poker, K2 Space Odyssey, and K3 Pro Football. Sadly, neither the keyboard controller nor any of these planned games were ever released. It's thought that the problem of the original consoles and their hardwired controllers put pay to these plans. Like one of its biggest rivals, in the form of the 1292 Advanced Programmable Video System, the Channel F hardware was licensed out to a huge number of different manufacturers around the world, although the success of these many variations was pretty limited. Some of these changed both the name and the design, for example the German Saba Video Play and French Nord Mende Color Tele Play, whilst other variations kept the aesthetics pretty close to the original Fairchild console, like the Swedish Luxor Video Entertainment System and British Grandstand Video Entertainment Computer. Interestingly, Grandstand also released their own versions of the 1292 Advanced Programmable Video System too, seemingly happy to hedge their bets, hoping one or the other or both would succeed and make the decision for them. Other international variations of the Channel F included the ITT Telematch Processor, also from Germany, the Italian Barco Challenger, the Belgian Dumont Video Play, and Emerson Video Play, which was sold in several different countries and regions. Emerson would also be another company to back the 129 to advance programmable video system too, eventually developing the technology inside it further to create their very own Emerson Arcadia 2001 console. I already talked about the creation of the very first cartridges for use with the Fairchild Channel F, but there is another facet to the cartridge design that I want to talk about too, and it's another feature that greatly influenced the consoles that followed, before eventually being phased out. For the first batch of cartridges to be released for the Channel F, each one was given a number, starting from Video Cart 1, which contained Tic-Tac-Toe, Shooting Gallery, Doodle and Quadradoodle. Both the labels and the boxes put the number first and foremost, with the actual name of the game or games included being relegated to a very small piece of text underneath the image. Although this seems like a very strange way to market video games, the idea actually stuck, at least for a while, 
with rival consoles like the Philips Video Pack 129 to advance programmable video system and indeed the Atari 2600 adopting the same strategy. However, it was a lot less prominent with the latter as the name took equal billing and Atari soon realised the value of names and trademarks, dropping the sequential numbering after the initial launch period and others followed their example. In total, there were 26 numbered releases, though recent homebrews have actually followed this up by continuing the same sequence on their boxes to add authenticity. One of the most little known facts about the Fairchild Channel F, but by far one of the most interesting tidbits of trivia, is that the console was also the first to be featured on a TV show, which seems quite staggering when you consider its 1976 release date, long before video games had entered the mainstream. First broadcast in 1978 on Los Angeles station KABC TV as part of AM Los Angeles, TV Pal was a game show in which home viewers controlled a video game via a telephone in hopes of winning prizes. The show proved to be a big success and it was soon franchised out to 79 local television stations across the United States. At the heart of the show was a Fairchild Channel F console and the games used on the show consisted of tic-tac-toe, maze, dodge it, shooting gallery, quadradoodle, baseball and bowling. Consoles were also given away as prizes. As the game appeared on the screen, the player at home would shout commands down the phone whilst watching. When the viewer determined that the weapon was aiming at the target, they said POW, hoping for success. However, the big issue with this was that due to broadcasting technicalities, there was a significant lag in the transmission of a television signal. So the player would experience this lag when playing at home, making the game much harder to play correctly. You'd basically have to guess movements in advance. These many technical issues didn't seem to dampen the popularity of the show, strangely. After Fairchild withdrew from the video game market in 1979, the Channel F consoles on TV PAL were replaced with a newly released Mattel in television, with the show growing to even greater success. It's a shame Fairchild weren't able to do more to capitalise on this unique venture. In the face of a glut of competition, most notably the Atari video computer system, Fairchild had noticed a steep decline in sales, and in 1979 Fairchild announced the new and much revised Channel F Model 2, which would be functionally identical to the previous model internally, but looked very different on the outside, remaining fully backwards compatible. The new much lower profile design had less wood grain and more black plastic to keep up with the trends of the time and looked less VCR-like and more console-like in design. The buttons were also different, and instead of a compartment to put your controllers, it had holders for them on the back. Other, even more notable differences included new detachable controllers, so they could easily be swapped or replaced, and the sound now being diverted through the TV, rather than an internal speaker, which was seen as a very positive change indeed. The motherboard had also been simplified, with two custom logic chips replacing the standard TTL logic chips. This is how Fairchild were able to implement a much smaller, simpler and more modern looking case design. This next entry is very much connected to the last one, because shortly after Fairchild released the new Model 2 console, they decided to sell the rights to the Channel F to a company called Zircon feeling that they couldn't compete financially with the likes of Atari, Mattel and Philips, and it was better to get out whilst the going was good to focus on other electronics. Zircon came in with lofty plans for the Channel F, announcing price cuts on the consoles and cartridges, as well as promising a series of new, more advanced games that would better compete with what Atari were offering. However, they only ever released six games before calling it quits themselves just two years later, stopping production of new consoles and games in 1981. Most of these new titles weren't even that new either, having previously been developed at Fairchild and featured in their catalogues. Stuff like chess, slot machine and video poker did little to excite audiences. However, the last game, Alien Invasion, showed a lot of promise, being a pretty blatant clone of Space Invaders, but it was too little too late. Existing stock was liquidated over the next couple of years via various channels before the Channel F was officially discontinued in 1983. 
but by this time the ColecoVision and Atari 5200 had arrived and the Channel F looked positively ancient in comparison, meaning Zircon were probably right to stop supporting it completely and discontinue it. One last thing that Zircon did before shutting down completely though was release a new version of the Channel F controller called the Jet Stick, which featured an action button on the front. This was on the market for Christmas 1982, but only sold in small numbers. They also produced another version that could be used with the Atari 2600 too, called the Video Command Joystick, which was released in 1983, but again, these were only produced in very small numbers. I briefly touched on the Channel F homebrew scene earlier in the video when I was talking about the numbered cartridges, but wanted to come back to it because I feel that they very much deserve an entry of their own. I don't really have the time to list them all here, but there are three in particular that I want to mention because they're so incredibly impressive. The first is Pac-Man, released in 2009, to amazement from the retro gaming community. This was the first homebrew game to be given a number, being christened Video Cart 27. Developed by Blackbird, this is a simply incredible port of the Namco arcade game that is far superior to the one released for the Atari 2600 back in the day. The second one I want to talk about is Video Cart 28, or Tetris as it's better known. Now I'm sure you're thinking that Tetris isn't a very advanced game, and is probably quite easy to implement, and I suppose you're right, but what really impresses with Peter Trauner's port is the split screen 2 player mode, which nobody thought was possible given the limited processing power of the Channel F. And last, but most certainly not least, I have to mention Arlasoft's jaw dropping conversion of the seminal Atari arcade game Centipede. This has all the fast and furious shoot em up action of the original, with loads happening on screen, excellent controls, and even some impressive sound too. All three of these have also been released on real cartridges that you could actually purchase to play on real hardware too, which makes them even better. I really wanted to keep this entry for the end, because I feel it's the most important part of all the legacy of Fairchild engineer Jerry Lawson, who finalised the design for the Fairchild Channel F and helped bring it to market. He was subsequently dubbed the father of the video game cartridge by many, including Black Enterprise magazine in 1982, as the very first black video game hardware and software engineer. He joined Fairchild in 1970, where he soon worked his way through the ranks to become their chief hardware engineer. Jerry was also a member of the Homebrew Computer Club, a group of early computer hobbyists including several notable names in the industry, such as Apple founders Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. In fact, Lawson once noted that he had interviewed Wozniak for a position at Fairchild, but didn't hire him. He left Fairchild just after the sale of the channel left to Zircon in 1980, where he went off to form his own company called Videosoft. As part of this new venture, he would develop games for the Channel F's biggest rival, the Atari 2600. After the company shut down in 1985, he went on to do a number of different consulting jobs, including a project called the Wonder Clock, a vision of none other than Stevie Wonder, which allowed parents to add their voice to an alarm clock to wake their children up in the morning. In 2003, Jerry Lawson started having complications from his diabetes, losing the use of one leg and his sight for one eye. On April the 9th, 2011, about one month after being honoured by the International Game Developers Association, he died of complications from his diabetes. He has gone on to receive many more posthumous awards, including a permanent exhibition at the Video Game Hall of Fame, and had his former high school in Los Angeles named after him. In May 2021, the University of Southern California and leading games publishers Take to Interactive established the Gerald A. Lawson Fund, to support black and indigenous students enrolled on the university's programming classes, seeking careers in the video game industry. Microsoft also joined this venture and began contributing to the fund shortly after. His legacy really can't be understated. Boy, was he funny. That's it, laugh it up, gang. This is what they were laughing at 30 years ago. Let me show you a great way to have fun today. Fairchild's Channel F Video System 2. There are 24 cartridges with over 1,000 game variations. You take it from a guy who's been in television since it was, oh, radio. Get a Channel F Video System. Believe me, you'll have a burrow. I mean, a ball. <laughs> Available at Dart Drug. 
And that rounds up my look at 10 amazing Fairchild Channel F facts. Which one of these fabulous facts was your favourite, or can you think of any other tantalising tidbits of trivia that I didn't include? As always, I love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comments section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons who continue to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons and YouTube backers in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Paul Daniel, Mins, Dos Gamer Man, Luke MC, Carl Olsen, Seth Robinson, Grady Haynes, Mark Strickland, Kalima Torn, Trogdor the Burninator, Daniel Skronsky, Pen P. Stein, Tabby Kitsun, Alan J. Dodds, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.